People and computers are very different from one another. There is one way that we're alike. You know how? We're both vulnerable to getting an infection. While humans can be infected by a virus that causes a cold or flu, computers can be affected by malware. Malware is software designed to harm devices or networks. Malware, which is short for malicious software, can be spread in many ways. For example, it could be spread through an affected USB drive or also commonly spread between computers online. Devices and systems that are connected to the internet are especially vulnerable to infection. When a device becomes infected, malware interferes with its normal operations. Attackers use malware to take control of the infected system without the user's knowledge or permission. Malware has been a threat to people and organizations for a long time. Attackers have created many different strains of malware. They all vary in how they're spread. Five of the most common types of malware are a virus, worm, trojan, ransomware, and spyware. Let's take a look at how each of them work. A virus is malicious code written to interfere with computer operations and cause damage to data and software. Viruses typically hide inside of trusted applications. When the infected program is launched, the virus clones itself and spreads to other files on the device. An important characteristic of viruses is that they have to be activated by the user to start the infection. The next kind of malware doesn't have this limitation. A worm is malware that can duplicate and spread itself across systems on its own. While viruses require users to perform an action like opening a file to duplicate, worms use an affected device as a host. They scan the connected network for other devices. Worms then infect everything on the network without requiring an action to trigger the spread. Viruses and worms are delivered through phishing emails and other methods before they infect a device. Making sure you click links only from trusted sources is one way to avoid these types of infection. However, attackers have designed another form of malware that can get past this precaution. A Trojan, or Trojan horse, is malware that looks like a legitimate file or program. The name is a reference to an ancient Greek legend that's set in the city of Troy. In Troy, a group of soldiers hid inside a giant wooden horse that was presented as a gift to their enemies. It was accepted and brought inside the city walls. Later that evening, the soldiers inside the horse climbed out and attacked the city. Like this ancient tale, attackers designed Trojans to appear harmless. This type of malware is typically disguised as files or useful applications to trick their target into installing them. Attackers often use Trojans to gain access and install another kind of malware called ransomware. Ransomware is a type of malicious attack where attackers encrypt an organization's data and demand payment to restore access. These kind of attacks have become very common these days. A unique feature of ransomware attacks is that they make themselves known to their targets. Without doing this, they couldn't collect the money they demand. Normally, they decrypt the hidden data as soon as the sum of money is paid. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee they won't return to demand more. The last type of malware I want to mention is spyware. Spyware is malware that's used to gather and sell information without consent. Consent is a key word in this case. Organizations also collect information about their customers, like their browsing habits and purchase history. However, they always give their customers the ability to opt out. Cybercriminals, on the other hand, use spyware to steal information. They use spyware attacks to collect data like login credentials, account pins, and other types of sensitive information for their own personal gain. There are many other types of malware besides these, and new forms are always evolving. They all pose a serious risk to individuals and organizations. Next time, we'll explore how security teams detect and remove these kinds of threats. Malware has been around nearly as long as computers. In its earliest forms, it was used by troublemakers as a form of digital vandalism. In today's digital world, malware has become a profitable crime that attackers use for their own financial gain. As a security professional, it's important that you remain aware of the latest evolutions. Let's take a closer look at one way malware has evolved. We'll then use this example to consider how malware can be spotted 
and how you can proactively protect against malware. Ransomware is one of the types of malware attackers use to steal money. Another and more recent type of malware is cryptojacking. Cryptojacking is a form of malware that installs software to illegally mine cryptocurrencies. You may be familiar with cryptocurrency from the news. If you're new to the topic, cryptocurrencies are a form of digital money that have real world value. Like physical forms of currency, there are many different types. For the most part, they're referred to as coins or tokens. In simple terms, crypto mining is a process used to obtain new coins. Crypto mining is similar to the process for mining for other resources, like gold. Mining for something like gold involves machinery, such as trucks and bulldozers that can dig through the earth. Crypto coins, on the other hand, use computers instead. Rather than digging through the earth, the computers run software that dig through billions of lines of encrypted code. When enough code is processed, a crypto coin can be found. Generally, more computers mining for coins mean more cryptocurrency can be discovered. Criminals unfortunately figured this out. Beginning in 2017, crypto jacking malware started being used to gain unauthorized control of personal computers to mine cryptocurrency. Since that time, crypto jacking techniques have become more sophisticated. Criminals now regularly target vulnerable servers to spread their mining software. Devices that communicate with the infected server become infected themselves. The malicious code then runs in the background, mining for coins unknown to anyone. Crypto jacking software is hard to detect. Luckily, security professionals have sophisticated tools that can help. An intrusion detection system, or IDS, is an application that monitors system activity and alerts on possible intrusions. When abnormal activity is detected, like malware mining for coins, the IDS alerts security personnel. Despite their usefulness, detection systems have a major drawback. New forms of malware can remain undetected. Fortunately, there are subtle signs that indicate a device is infected with cryptojacking software or other forms of malware. By far the most telling sign of a cryptojacking infection is slowdown. Other signs include increased CPU usage, sudden system crashes, and fast draining batteries. Another sign is unusually high electricity costs related to the resource intensive process of crypto mining. It's also good to know that there are certain measures you can take to reduce the likelihood of experiencing a malware attack like crypto jacking. These defenses include things like using browser extensions designed to block malware, using ad blockers, disabling JavaScript, and staying alert on the latest trends. Security analysts can also educate others in their organizations on malware attacks. While crypto jacking is still relatively new, attacks are becoming more common. The type of malicious code cybercriminal spread is continually evolving. It takes many years of experience to analyze new forms of malware. Nevertheless, you're well on your way towards helping defend against these threats. Whether it's installed on an individual computer or a network server, all malicious software needs to be delivered to the target before it can work. Phishing and other social engineering techniques are common ways for malware to be delivered. Another way it's spread is using a broad class of threats known as web-based exploits. Web-based exploits are malicious code or behavior that's used to take advantage of coding flaws in a web application. Cybercriminals target web-based exploits to obtain sensitive personal information. Attacks occur because web applications interact with multiple users across multiple networks. Malicious hackers commonly exploit this high level of interaction using injection attacks. An injection attack is malicious code inserted into a vulnerable application. The infected application often appears to work normally. That's because the injected code runs in the background unknown to the user. Applications are vulnerable to injection attacks because they are programmed to receive data inputs. This could be something the user types, clicks, or something one program is sharing with another. When coded correctly, applications should be able to interpret and handle user inputs. For example, let's say an application is expecting the user to enter a phone number. This application should validate the input from the user to make sure the data is all numbers and not more than 10 digits. If the input from the user doesn't meet these requirements, the application should know how to handle it. In programming, this is known as input sanitization. 
Input sanitization is programming that validates inputs from users in other programs. Injection attacks mainly affect applications that fail to sanitize inputs. Because of this, web applications are one of the most vulnerable targets for injection attacks. Web apps interact with multiple users across many platforms. They also have a lot of interactive objects, like images and buttons. This makes it challenging for developers to think of all the ways they should sanitize their input. A common and dangerous type of injection attack that's a threat to web apps is cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting, or XSS, is an injection attack that inserts code into a vulnerable website or web application. These attacks are often delivered by exploiting the two languages used by most websites, HTML and JavaScript. Both can give cybercriminals access to everything that loads on the infected web page. This can include session cookies, geolocation, and even webcams and microphones. There are three main types of cross-site scripting attacks, reflected, stored, and DOM-based. A reflected XSS attack is an instance where a malicious script is sent to the server and activated during the server's response. A common example of this is the search bar of a website. In a reflected XSS attack, criminals send their target a web link that appears to go to a trusted site. When they click the link, it sends a HTTP request to the vulnerable site server. The attacker's script is then returned or reflected back to the innocent user's browser. Here, the browser loads the malicious script because it trusts the server's response. With the script loaded, information like session cookies are sent back to the attacker. In a stored XSS attack, the malicious script isn't hidden in a link that needs to be sent to the server. Instead, a stored XSS attack is an instance when malicious script is injected directly on the server. Here, attackers target elements of a site that are served to the user. This could be things like images and buttons that load when the site is visited. Infected elements activate the malicious code when a user simply visits the site. Stored XSS attacks can be damaging because the user has no way of knowing the site is infected beforehand. Finally, there's DOM-based XSS. DOM stands for Document Object Model which is basically the source code of a website. A DOM-based XSS attack is an instance when malicious script exists in the web page a browser loads. Unlike reflected XSS, these attacks don't need to be sent to the server to activate. In a DOM-based attack, a malicious script can be seen in the URL. In this example, the website's URL contains parameter values the parameter values reflect input from the user. Here, the site allows users to select color themes. When the user makes a selection, it appears as part of the URL. In a DOM-based attack, criminals change the parameter that's suspecting an input. For example, they could hide malicious JavaScript in the HTML tags. The browser would process the HTML and execute the JavaScript. Hackers use these methods of cross-site scripting to steal sensitive information. Security analysts should be familiar with this group of injection attacks. However, they're not the only ones, as we'll discover next time. Let's keep exploring injection attacks by investigating another common type of web-based exploit. The next one we're going to discuss exploits the way websites access information from databases. Early in the program, you may have learned about SQL. You may recall SQL is a programming language used to create, interact with, and request information from a database. SQL is used by most web applications. For example, shopping websites use it a lot. Imagine the databases of an online clothing store. It likely contains a full inventory of all the items the company sells. Websites don't normally make users enter the SQL queries manually. Instead, they use things like menus, images, and buttons to show users information in a meaningful way. For example, when an online shopper clicks a button to add a sweater to their cart, it triggers a SQL query. The query runs in the background where no one can see it. You'll never know from using the menus and buttons of a website, 
but sometimes those backend queries are vulnerable to injection attacks. A SQL injection is an attack that executes unexpected queries on a database. Like cross-site scripting, SQL injection occurs due to the lack of sanitized input. The injections take place in an area of the website that are designed to accept user input. A common example is the login form to access a site. One of these forms might trigger a backend SQL statement like this when a user enters their credentials. Web forms, like this one, are designed to copy user input into the statement exactly as they're written. The statement then sends a request to the server, which runs the query. Websites that are vulnerable to SQL injection inserts the user input exactly as it's entered before running the code. Unfortunately, this is a serious design flaw. It commonly happens because web developers expect people to use their inputs correctly. They don't anticipate attackers exploiting them. For example, an attacker might insert additional SQL code. This could cause the server to run a harmful query of code that it wasn't expecting. Malicious hackers can target these attack vectors to obtain sensitive information, modify tables, and even gain administrative rights to the database. The best way to defend against SQL injections is code that will sanitize the input. Developers can write code to search for specific SQL characters. This gives the server a clearer idea of what inputs to expect. One way this is done is with prepared statements. A prepared statement is a coding technique that executes SQL statements before passing them into the database. When the user input is unknown, the best practice is to use these prepared statements. With just a few extra lines of code, a prepared statement executes the code before passing it onto the server. This means the code can be validated before performing the query. Having well-written code is one of the keys to preventing SQL injection. Security teams work with program developers to test applications for these sort of vulnerabilities. Like a lot of security tasks, it's a team effort. Injection attacks are just one of many types of web-based exploits that security teams deal with. We're going to explore how security teams prepare for injection attacks and other kinds of threats. Preparing for attacks is an important job that the entire security team is responsible for. Threat actors have many tools they can use depending on their target. For example, attacking a small business can be different from attacking a public utility. Each have different assets and specific defenses to keep them safe. In all cases, anticipating attacks is the key to preparing for them. In security, we do that by performing an activity known as threat modeling. Threat modeling is the process of identifying assets, their vulnerabilities, and how each is exposed to threats. We apply threat modeling to everything we protect. Entire systems, applications, or business processes all get examined from this security-related perspective. Creating threat models is a lengthy and detailed activity. They are normally performed by a collection of individuals with years of experience in the field. Because of that, it's considered to be an advanced skill in security. However, that doesn't mean you won't be involved. There are several threat modeling frameworks used in the field. Some are better suited for network security. Others are better for things like information security or application development. In general, there are six steps of a threat model. The first is to define the scope of the model. At this stage, the team determines what they're building by creating an inventory of assets and classifying them. The second step is to identify threats. Here, the team defines all potential threat actors. A threat actor is any person or group who presents a security risk. Threat actors are characterized as being internal or external. For example, an internal threat actor could be an employee who intentionally exposed an asset to harm. An example of an external threat actor could be a malicious hacker or a competing business. After threat actors have been identified, the team puts together what's known as an attack tree. An attack tree is a diagram that maps threats to assets. The team tries to be as detailed as possible when constructing this diagram before moving on. Step three of the threat modeling process is to characterize the environment. 
Here, the team applies an attacker mindset to the business. They consider how the customers and employees interact with the environment. Other factors they consider are external partners and third-party vendors. At step four, their objective is to analyze threats. Here, the team works together to examine existing protections and identify gaps. They then rank threats according to their risk score that they assign. During step five, the team decides how to mitigate risks. At this point, the group creates their plan for defending against threats. The choices here are to avoid risk, transfer it, reduce it, or accept it. The sixth and final step is to evaluate findings. At this stage, everything that was done during the exercise is documented. Fixes are applied and the team makes note of any successes they had. They also record any lessons learned so they can inform how they approach future threat models. That's an overview of the general threat modeling process.